Excellent. Excellent. It's good news, people. It's good news. Kissinger is dead. Yes. Anybody who's heard the news today will know that Henry Kissinger, Heinz A. Kissinger, died. I smothered him with a pillow. I put it over his face and I held it down till he stopped his wriggling. He's dead to 100. It was me. I killed Henry Kissinger. Nah. But uh, they won't arrest me because uh, they don't like to admit the conspiracy theories are true. Anyway, I'm Johnny Vedmore. This is Newshound. Today we're going to go through the Henry Kissinger section of one of my, uh, what's described as my seminal work, the Dr. Klaus Schwab, or how the CFR taught me to stop worrying and love the bomb, which is about the, the education of Klaus Schwab at Harvard and how he was given mentors by Henry Kissinger himself, John Kenneth Galbraith and Herman Kahn, who's a real Dr. Strange Love. And of course, that article is very interesting, but it basically profiles three of uh, Schwab's main mentors that came from what was a CIA funded course at Harvard. Yes, Klaus Schwab went for a CIA funded course run by Henry Kissinger, who was at this point uh, the, the one of the most important men and world history makers. I mean, you can't even uh, grasp how someone can get as much power as Henry Kissinger did. And so what we're going to do is read through some of the articles and look through some of the sources and go on a little adventure like we do on Newshound, where I look at the sources of of things. And this is going through some of the sources of the Henry Kissinger section. It should take us a little bit of time, just a little bit of time, maybe an hour and a half or something, if you've got that time to spare. Um, and uh, and we're going to, I go to share with you my screen now. Welcome to Newshound. Ah, look at them. Look at them. Kissinger over there. Yeah, it, it, it says it next to Schwab. But it, 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 Schwab's got his own there uh, that you can't see. And here we go. Another episode of Newshound. And like I say, this is from the article, which is uh, Dr. Klaus Schwab, or how the CFR taught me to stop worrying and love the bomb. And the introduction goes, the World Economic Forum wasn't simply the brainchild of Klaus Schwab, but was actually born out of a CIA-funded Harvard program headed by Henry Kissinger and pushed to fruition by John Kenneth Galbraith and the real Dr. Strangelove, Herman Kahn. This is the amazing story behind the real men who recruited Klaus Schwab, who helped him create the World Economic Forum, and who taught him to stop worrying and love the bomb. And this article took me about a year to research and get to properly get through properly because well i mean henry kissinger and klaus schwab they're the type of new world order folks that uh, of course um do people need to hide the history of now because otherwise we realize where our institutions evolved from and who's really behind them? Ooh, it doesn't like me moving that down there. It wants me to do it sadly. Here we go. Oh, yeah. But, but. Ah. Let's read a little bit of the intro before we get to the Henry Kissinger, because it's worth reading this. The World Economic Forum's recorded history has been manufactured to appear as though the organization was strictly a European co creation. But this isn't so. In fact, Klaus Schwab had an elite American political team working in the shadows that aided him in the cre creating the European-based globalist organization. If you have a decent knowledge of Klaus Schwab's history, you will know that he attended Harvard in the 1960s, where he would meet then-professor Henry A. Kissinger, a man with whom Schwab would form a lifelong friendship. But as with most information from the annals of the World Economic Forum's history books, what you've been told is not the full story. In fact, Kissinger would recruit Schwab at the International Seminar at Harvard, which had been funded by the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency. Although his funding was exposed in the year in which Klaus Schwab left Harvard, the connection has gone largely unnoticed until now. <laughs> finding it was brilliant. I did a little dance. I did a few little dances, you know, um, to realize he had gone through a CIA funded course. I mean, I had found the story, but there was lots in this story. My research indicates that the World Economic Forum is not a European creation. In reality, it is instead an operation which emanates from the public policy grandees of Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixonian eras of American politics. 
all of whom had ties to the Council on Foreign Relations and associated roundtable movements with a supporting role played by the Central Intelligence Agency. It wasn't just a supporting role. It was a bit more than that. Um, there were three extremely powerful and influential men, Kissinger among them, who would lead Klaus Schwab towards their ultimate goal of complete American empire-aligned global domination via the creation of social and economic policies. In addition, two of the men were at the core of manufacturing the ever-present global uh, threat of global thermonuclear war. By examining these men through the wider context of the geopolitics of the period, I will show how their paths would cross and coalesce during the 1960s, how they recruited Klaus Schwab through a CIA-funded program, and how they were the real driving force behind the creation of the World Economic Forum. Do it! So that's the emperor voice there, my emperor voice. And here we go. This is where we start delving through. So we're going to be flicking in and out of this article. And as you see in the articles I write, they're always heavily sourced. Um, they're getting, I'm getting better at the sourcing as well. I'm getting much better. They're actually getting even more heavily sourced in the this time. But this has got a lot. So you, you'll see every place is an underline. There's a, there's a source. Uh, and this section, Henry Kissinger section, is the section we're going through. And you see it's got lots of different points. And these points will lead us, show us the evidence back in a, to back up what I have said within the piece. It's what journalism is all about, isn't it? You show your workings. Henry A. Kissinger. Heinz Alfred Kissinger was born in Bavaria, Germany on the 27th of May, 1923 to Paula and Louis Kissinger. The family had been one of many Jewish families fleeing the persecution in Germany to arrive in America in 1938. Kissinger would change his first name to Henry at 15 years old when arriving in America by way of a brief emigration to London. His family would initially settle in Upper Manhattan with the young Henry Kissinger attending George Washington High School. In 1942, Kissinger would enroll in the City College of New York, but in early 1943, he was drafted into the U.S. Army. On the 19th of June, 1943, Kissinger would become a naturalized U.S. citizen. He would soon be assigned to the 84th Infantry Division, where he would be recruited with legendary, by the legendary Fritz Kramer to work in the military intelligence unit of the division. Kramer would fight alongside Kissinger during the Battle of the Bulge and would later become extremely influential in American politics during the post-war era, influencing future politicians such as Donald Rumsfeld. Henry Kissinger would describe Kramer as being the greatest single influence on my formative year. In a New York a New Yorker article, The Myth of Henry Kissinger, written in 2020, the article, uh, the writer of the article, Thomas Meany, describes Kramer as a Nishian firebrand, firebrand to the point of self-parody. He wore a monocle in his good eye to make his weak eye work harder. Kramer claimed to have spent the late Weimar years fighting both communist and Nazi brown shirts in the streets. He had doctorates in political science and international law and pursued a promising career at the League of Nations before fleeing to the US in 1939. He warned Kissinger not to emulate cleverling intellectuals and their bloodless cost-benefit analysis. analysis. Believing Kissinger to be a musically attuned to history, he told him, only if you do not calculate... Will you really have the freedom which distinguishes you from the little people? Those are big words, you know. That's big words. This is the big, this is the big talk of um, Kissinger. So we're going to uh, go through some of the, the, the sources there. We want to know first this Fritz Kramer character. I mean, this Fritz Kramer was a massive influence because he recruited um, uh, Kissinger into military intelligence. And there you see Dr. For picture of Dr. Fritz Kramer with his protege, 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 Henry Kissinger as soldiers of the 84th U.S. Infantry Division in Germany in 1945, fighting for the liberation of their former Vaterland, because they were both Germans, of course, fighting for liberation. Um, this, now this is interesting. 
you'll hear a tinge of uh, love for Henry Kissinger within this, because this is actually from a site um, called the World Security Network, who I come across because Nicole Yunkerman, uh, the Epstein associate, was a member of the World Security Network, um, alongside a load of others. And they actually, at one point, they actually um, said that Libya, the the, the the terrible events of Libya which should be a, a model for future wars. The, the place that let the type of uh, war that left slave markets in the country. So this was a really interesting site. And I thought I'd put this in because it's kind of from their side. So you get to see how they speak about people and how they act about people. And it's, it's also, you know, it, it it allows us to see it from a German perspective at a global, from a globalist German perspective. I find that interesting. Anyway, and this is uh, from who was Dr. Fritz Kramer. Uh, and it says it was written in 2013 by Tillman Dietrich, who's on the slide here, uh, attended school in Switzerland. Well done, you. Um obviously lots of international relations this is an international relations policy institute dr fritz g a kramer was the most influential german in the pentagon from 1952 to 1978 mm. geostrategic advisor to u.s army chief of staff in the u.s department of defense the true dr strange love unique with monocle and walking stick a last prussian and the potomac river um in uh washington dc now herman khan is known as the doc real dr strange love who's also profiled in this article and what when when i said that and of course herman khan says i asked kubrick and kubrick promised me that i wasn't the 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 the, the real dr strange love but dr strange love was an amalgamation in my opinion of all of these people fritz kramer was a perfect monocle wearing eccentric uh the the mind the, the sense of kissinger was in there too um uh, and uh herman khan and his uh, zoom to the moon sort of um rhetoric was in there too so i think it was an amalgamation of characters so i met you know even though i say the, the uh the real dr strange love there's lots of people who who uh get given that um from this period in this circle that get given that moniker uh, the German emigrant to the U.S. born in Essen in 1908 with Christian denomination but Jewish roots. Kramer, an intellectual with two PhDs, scraped a living as a farm worker for five years. In 1944, he was conscripted and thus became a U.S. citizen. Kramer discovered and mentored two U.S. secretaries of state, Henry Kissinger and Alexander Haig. In 1944, he met the 19-year-old Henry Kissinger, who was also emigrated from Germany. He formed uh, as he formed as Kissinger's Kissinger, his thinking and worldview, and fought with him in the 84th U.S. Infantry Division for the liberation of Europe. Kissinger himself writes about it in his book true keeper of the holy flame by uh, in 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 the book sorry true keeper of uh the holy flame by herbertus herbertus hoffman now herbertus hoffman who you would probably never have heard about before is the head of the world security network like i say you're within it you're indulging you're indulging in their own rhetoric kramer placed young Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Haig uh, with newly appointed National Security Advisor Henry Kissinger in the White House. The, late, the la uh, later U.S. Secretary of State describes how this was possible in his contribution to the book. Fritz Kramer saw himself as a missionary of freedom and a mentor for unknown young talents who should take over responsibility for their country as the new elite, which is something that was handed down to Henry Kissinger. This is very much the point of Kissinger's international seminar and the creation of uh, people people like Klaus Schwab and others who would go on to be heading up globalist institutions and policy creation uh, um, units around the world aimed at promoting uh, American and European aligned global and British aligned global 
Um, empire, empire. It is empire. It's all empire. Um, he was the co-founder of the American School of Thought, Peace Through Strength. No provocative weakness, please, became an often cited dictum. To improve the world and promote the consideration of human psychology and international relations with inner m musicality for a foreign policy with a soul. A critic of moral, moral relativism and of fearful and weak bourgeoisie um, who, according to him, do not understand the threat through totalitarian radicals um, and most uh, times shy away from it. As a young boy, Kramer experienced the German Empire as a student of the Weimar Republic and the rise of Adolf Hitler. From 1944, he fought for liberation in his homeland from totalitarianism with the United States Army. In the Pentagon, he became a great eminence during the Cold War, an authority on Germany and an educator of high-ranking officers and politicians. He always remained true, a true Prussian inside his heart and stood by his strong principles of, of, as a freedom fighter. He passed away in 2003 and was buried with full military honours in Arlington National Cemetery. The eulogy, was, the eulogy was delivered by his former pupil, Henry Kissinger, with whom he had not spoken since the mid-1970s. Hubertus Hoffman, in his new book, explains for the first time why Kramer and Kissinger split. Again, really useful to be inside the, 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 the world, their world here. His master pupil and former U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, Fritz Kramer was the greatest single influence of my formative years, an extraordinary man who will be a part of my life as long as I shall draw breath. His protege, um, former U.S. Secretary of State Alexander Haig, for me, Dr. Kramer's lifetime of service confirms the importance of a nation's elites in pursuing the advancing and value of free society. I can think of no individual who patient tutelage made a more meaningful contribution to shaping my own world view. U.S. President Richard Nixon, whom uh, he briefed with Kissinger in the Oval Office on October 24th, 1972, praised, I like him. Oh, I like him and read his stuff. I appreciate to have intelligent appraisal by someone who really understands great forces at work in the world. It's been very helpful. The future is the futurologist. That's a mouthful. Herman Kahn, the real Dr. Strangelove, again, okay, both of them are, of the Hudson Institute writes, if there is anyone who has stood for uh, good and the true, it's Fritz Kramer. He knows what he stands for and he says what he stands for. I just finish this off. I say Henning Habertus Baron von Steuben puts Fritz Kramer alongside one of the ancestors, one of his ancestors, Friedrich um, uh, Wilhelm von Steuben, the first Inspector General of the U.S. Army under George Washington. Steuben and Kramer have, at intervals of their two centuries, put their mark on the United States Army as officers um, through their deeply rooted Prussian values, such as integrity, honor, discipline, and duty for their homeland, and coined the United States Army with their spirit. Um, so that's Fritz Kramer there with his man henry kissinger the young henry kissinger and it's really worth making a note of that for its kramer being uh such an important part of uh henry kissinger's life and uh and noted in that article was the myth of henry kissinger uh which is an extremely interesting article uh it has lots of different things in it that that uh will you know i'm not going to read through it all um but really important parts and gives you tips and hints but also leaves out a load of stuff too which of course is exactly what you'd expect from a, 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 a outlet like the new yorker in this case um, we read the first paragraph. In 1952, at the age of 28, Henry Kissinger did what enterprising graduate students do when they want to hedge their academic futures. He started a magazine. He picked up an imposing name, Confluence, and enlisted illustrious contributors, Hannah Arendt, Arendt Raymond Aaron, uh, Lillian Smith, Arthur Scheisling, Scheislinger, Scheislinger, who I think becomes uh, head of uh, the Schlesinger, becomes head of the CIA, doesn't he? Uh, junior. Uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, 
Um, the publisher, James Lochlin, who was a backer of the magazine, described the young Kissinger as a thoroughly sincere person, terribly earnest Germanic type, who is trying his hardest to do an idealistic job. Like his other early productions, the Harvard International Seminar, a summer program that convened participants from around the world, Kissinger gamely volunteered to spy on attendees for the FBI. The magazine opened channels for him, not only with policymakers in Washington, but also with the older generation of German Jewish thinkers whose political experience had been formed in the early 30s when the Weimar Republic was supplanted by the Nazi regime. For Cold War liberals who saw the stirrings of fascism in everything from McCarthyism to the rise of mass culture, Weimar was a cautionary tale, conferring a certain authority on those who had survived. Kissinger cultivated the Weimar intellectuals, but he was not impressed by their prospects for influence. Although he later invoked the memory of Nazism to justify all manner of power plays, at this stage he was building a reputation as an all-American maverick. He appalled the emigres by running an article in Confluence by Ernest von Salomon, a far-rightist who had hired a getaway driver for the men who assassinated the Weimar Republic's foreign minister. I have now joined you as a cardinal villain in the liberal demonology, Kissinger told a friend afterwards, joking that the peace was being taken as a symptom of my totalitarian and even Nazi sympath sympathies. Now, here we go. It's very important to read those first two articles because you get to see how they twist the establishment, like the New Yorker establishment, twist the, the, the truth around so you, you hear it, but you don't hear it and i will explain it let me do the old-fashioned smoking of a blunt <coughs> oh. <coughs> oh dear lord <coughs> well that was hot so Ladies and gentlemen, please, 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 ladies and gentlemen. 1952, Henry Kissinger did what an enterprising graduate student uh, students do when they hedge their academic future. He started a magazine. No. <clears throat> William Yandel Elliott had put him in charge of his international seminar, and it was funded by uh, loads of CIA conduits, and the magazine itself, Confluence there, was actually funded by the Rockefeller Foundation. And it says there, he picked an imposing name, Confluence, uh, and listed illustrious contributors, blah de blah de blah de blah and, and they tried to make him sound like he's the one, oh, he started a magazine. The magazine opened channels for him. Policy makers, in, yeah, it was, it was, uh, he was starting, it was starting to train globalist leaders, um, and Confluence was a, I think it was, uh, it was quarterly, or by quarterly, I can't remember which one it was. I think it, I, I get a feeling it might have been. I get it, it just feels like they, it, it wasn't. It, it might have actually been three a year. I can't quite remember. But anyway, um, it it was uh, a magazine which included lots of a range of different people who Kissinger had had links with in different ways, but also who would put across this globalist idea um uh, and and would would uh, allow for a discussion about that in their own countries and would also create links that would mean that the international seminar could be populated by the best students from around the world the whole point of having these people and having this magazine was for the international seminar and the international seminar was to train the youngest the young recruits now you see that in um uh the the later uh, article the next article uh the kissinger continuum that's within this series um it, that 
I'm able to show you uh, how the details of the World Economic Forums uh, of, of the Harvard's International Seminar um, uh, and how they advertise, including, uh, for instance, in the Lahore Evening Gazette or Military Gazette. It was the Lahore Military Gazette in India uh, ran um, articles in 1956, 1957 and 1958, not articles, little adverts in the corner. And it was for Kissinger's International Seminar. And it said, basically, the best people get to come to the seminar. Everything will be paid for. You've got to apply, but you've got to be the best ever like basically and they were looking for leaders of each country and they would go over and they would get given all of this you know th these connections that were made with confluence would be connections all around the world i mean this was him creating a network a globalist education network for the young leaders of tomorrow for the young global leaders so um the, then, where it says Kissinger Gamely volunteered to spy on attendees for the FBI. Now, that's an interesting fact, but I'm not sure if they, he's actually mixing up something else there or if that's true, because I didn't find any evidence that he asked the FBI. What I found evidence is, is in 1950, 1950, 1951, when this was being organized, he was just leaving Harvard. He had finished in 1950 officially. And in 1950, he applied to work for the FBI. And the uh, it was Muck George Bundy, um, who at Harvard, who said, no, 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 you shouldn't go work for the, the FBI. You should go work for the CFR. And the CFR, of course, were heavily linked, headed up um, at one point by the Rockefellers. Um, and always like were, were a, a Rockefeller heavy institution um, and the CFR were, he was at the same time he was doing the international seminar he was working in the CFR policy studies uh, concentrated on nuclear warfare so this is a time where he was offering himself to the FBI, got told by George Bundy, no, you don't want to go there. I will nominate you for the CFR. Went to the CFR, started doing run-through and gaming out uh, potential nuclear uh, uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear holocaust on all sides, everything. Everybody dies. Like the potential for, for every country to, to be enveloped in, in a nuclear war that, that destroys humanity and whether that's possible. You know, they started gaming this out and discovering that it's not actually possible even if they created all the nukes they possibly could and fired it all at each other it would wipe out at most uh 40 to 50 percent of the population of the earth which isn't actually um that uh, you know uh, as as devastating as what they thought would happen you know the the fear on on the ground in if you went into the policy study in the policy institutes of the 1950s like the cfr where they're gaming this shit out they're not so worried about it anymore they already come into terms with the fact that it doesn't make any sense to kill yourself and kill everybody else at the same time. That doesn't make any sense. So people are probably not going to be forced, going to go that way. Um, what they were, if you go into the home of a normal person living in the 1950s, they're terrified that everybody's going to die very soon. It's apocalypse on its way. So the difference is they know the truth and they're keeping people in that frame of mind that they fear and fear and fear that the imminent doom is just around the corner. Um, and so it's a very interesting that he uh, goes and they say that he volunteered to spy um, attendees of the international seminar for the FBI. Well, of course, but he was already, he was already working with the FBI in many ways and he had offered himself his services to him. So it's not a surprise. And they're all linked in some way and they're all scratching each other's backs at that level. You know, he, he had, he hadn't only graduated from Harvard, he had graduated from Harvard with the largest dissertation ever recorded in Harvard. Harvard's history. He was being seen as a genius at one of the most uh, influential establish, uh, educational establishments in the whole of the, of the Americas. So, of course, he was, he was you know, going to be recruited by someone. It was by multiple people, but um, he offered himself round to all of the, the elites. And so it's interesting that they put their confluence as, oh, he just set up this magazine. No, the Rockefellers helped and set up and William Yandel Elliott, who never CFR guy, he 
he's he he actually recruited uh, Kissinger through Harvard to do all of this stuff. And Kissinger himself says it should have been called. Um, he had told William uh, Yandel Elliot that it should have been called Yandel Elliot's International Seminar rather than Kissinger's International Seminar. He told him that in about 1951, I think. Um, so they go in 1952. They start in 1952. Not mentioning that in 1950 he get get he graduates. He gets given this task of creating the international seminar by a head CFR member, who William Yandel Elliot is actually like advisor to to uh, six different presidents and one of the guys behind the scenes, a fucking puppet master, like you would not believe. Um, but they talk about confluence. They talk about these people and how ho ho ho, you're coming down to Nazi sympathies. Ho ho, they. they they think I'm a Nazi. It's because he is. He is. It, it, what, what you know? What uh, Kissinger did is he looked at everybody's games, the Nazi games, the capitalist game, all of the games. He looked at all of the games and he put them all together to see what would win. Made him dangerous, really dangerous. And uh, <clears throat> here we go. Let's go to New York Times, and this is what I was talking about. So this is New York Times, and this is Saturday, November the 3rd, 1979. The year of the Lord, 1979. And this is Herbert Mitgang. What a name. And it says here, Henry Kissinger, while teaching at Harvard University in 1953, volunteered his aid to the Federal Bureau of Investigation and supplied information touching on the seminar he was conducting. Okay, so so already he's he gets offered to do the seminar in 1950 and 1951, and instantly it's a game of intelligence. It's a game of intelligence nearly straight away, and he does this all the way through. So this come up in the hearings uh, that uh, my. Uh, that the, the um, uh, Richard Helms had uh, where senators asked him a load of questions about Watergate. Um, and he was saying that basically Kissinger and Nixon got into office and they changed the way uh, the intelligence work. Nixon Nixon needed to close off to, to do what he was doing and to act the way he was acting. Um, K Kissinger had advised him to close himself off completely. And he wanted to do that anyway. It was it suited him because he hated confrontation. Didn't like direct one-on-one -on -one confrontation. So people who were going to tell him not to do the things that he wanted to do, he would try and not talk to and avoid as much as possible. And so this worked out well for the intelligence linked to people like Kissinger who were advising him and wanted to lead him into or, or, or distance him from their own actions so they could be in office be direct in intelligence operations and richard nixon is is left in the dark mostly but there still has to be some form of communication about what's happening or not and that was kind of kissinger and what kissinger did was order helms um to go through them only uh and cut out certain parts of the other people who were involved so that they could that they would normally be involved in decision making in government in the White House and would normally have intelligence briefings while those briefings would really just go to Nixon um, Kissinger um, Ehrlichman and um, uh, Haldeman and it would be them who would make the decisions on what to do. And then they would be able to use the CIA as their political tool. And that led to Watergate. Of course, that led to Watergate. That They want, they were bugging the Democratic National um, Offices, uh, party offices. And th th that's what they, they got caught. Well, they were doing that because they had caught, got the CIA in Helms to act as their... Um, bulldogs uh, to go out and do the jobs that needed to be done so they could stay in political office and continue with the array of um, intelligence linked operations that they were doing and there you know had to be Nixon knew what was going on but I get a feeling Kissinger was the one who was pushing them upon 
him and pushing him in that direction. And Kissinger made it so that Helms and others had could, were only going to a very small and controllable group of people who would then use intelligence in a certain way. So I think that's very important to know. I know it's complex to uh, explain, um, but the whole of that era and the way Kissinger worked with intelligence uh, throughout his lifetime is extremely complex. It's extremely complex, uh, three-dimensional chess in many, many different ways. If I can say, uh, and supplied information, touching on the seminar he was conducting. Um, so he was offering information to the FBI at this point. This is 1953. He's going to the FBI. He's saying, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in here. Um, getting all of these people from all around the place and I can give you information about what's going on. So why not then inviting people who are people you want to get, you want to get control of, you want to get information on. If you're going to make, so think about this, think about this rationally. If you're going to make a young global leaders program, like the Kissinger's International Seminar was, that produces someone like Klaus Schwab, who then creates the Young Global Leaders program later on that, so that it continues, that is then funded by Henry Kissinger in 2004 through um, uh, a Dan David Foundation grant, a prize of a million dollars given to Schwab. And then he created the Young Global Leaders from the Global Leaders for Tomorrow, which was, of course, an extension of Kissinger's international seminar. Well, if you... you um, uh, want to do that you're going to be attracting loads of people from all around the world and you can collect information on them but at the same time if you throw amongst all of the people um that are uh intelligence linked uh potential spies who want to get in get in um people who want you you then want to be able to influence later with maybe compromise, compromat. Who do you get in? If you want someone to gather the compromise, gather the compromat, investigate these people, and use that later on as a way to say, well, now you're in power and you're a leader. And look, remember this? Oh, the FBI looked into you back then, and we would... They were, what they were doing was, was very sneaky. And most of the international seminar this would, would why some of this doesn't make too much sense. The international seminar was for international students coming to America. Why would the FBI need to be involved with international students? His involvement with the Bureau uh, came to light in a document obtained by Sigmund Diamond, Giddings Professor of Sociology and Professor of History at Columbia University. Professor Diamond is studying the relationship between colleges and the Bureau in the era of Senator Joe R. McCarthy. The document, an internal memorandum from the Bureau's Boston office to the FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover in Washington, was obtained through a request under Freedom of Information Act and will be now published in The Nation. On the no November the 10th issue, which will be released Monday, is to contain an analysis by Professor Diamond of Mr. Kissinger's relationship with the Bureau and the intelligence community. Mr. Kissinger declined to comment uh, personally to the Nation or the New York Times about the document, but an aide, William Highland, said the answer to the questions of Mr. Kissinger's alleged connections with the Bureau, the implication of these questions is ridiculous and contemptible. Now, this is from 1979, November the 3rd, 1979. FBI has no comment. Oh, really? David Cassens, a spokesman for the Bureau of Washington, said yesterday the FBI will not make any comment concerning documents released under the Freedom of Information Act. However, it is not unusual for the FBI to receive information from an individual in all, from individuals in all walks of life. The memorandum states that Mr. Kissinger telephoned the Boston office of the Bureau Friday morning, July 10th, 1953, identified himself as a teacher at Harvard, stated he had information of interest to the Bureau and requested an agent contact him that afternoon. 
A special agent interviewed Mr. Kissinger that day. In his report, he described Mr. Kissinger as teaching fellow in government as well as an executive director of international seminar at the summer school and editor of Confluence, an international forum. The seminar was set up through private sources <laughs> for individuals from abroad to discuss current problems with their contemporaries in the United States. Was it now? That's not quite true. The memorandum states that Mr. Kissinger made available literature about the seminar and that it was forwarded to the Bureau in Washington. Mr. Kissinger said that 40 participants were highly placed economically and politically and that the seminar hopes to place American policy in a favorable light in these nations. The Bureau documents stated, the special agents reported said that Mr. Kissinger's approach to the Bureau oop, had been touched off by the arrival of similar letters addressed to all individuals expected to appear at the seminar. The report states that Mr. Kissinger opened one of the 40 letters and it continues, enclosed in an inner envelope was eight page flyer captioned a few grains of truth. The flyer in general was highly critical of the American atom bomb project and set out what purported to represent the shame and anguish of the American population on American preparation for war. The memorandum quotes Mr. Kissinger as saying with five possible general sources that could have information about the identity of seminar participants were newspapers that were given a news release guest speakers. These people asked to extend hospitality on participants, former Governor Robert Bradford of Governor Robert Bradford of Massachusetts, who suggested the names of several guest speakers and staff of the Harvard Crimson, the student undergraduate daily newspaper. Harvard, Humphrey Dorman, I would think. The special agent uh, reported that Mr. Kissinger promised uh, to provide the Boston division an additional information, uh, any additional information at similar attempts. And the memorandum concluded steps will be taken to make Kissinger a confidential source of this division. In a who's who in America for which information is supplied by entrance, Mr. Kissinger includes the fact that he was a consultant at one time covered by the FBI memorandum to the Operations Research Office and the Psychological Strategy Board, among other military groups in Washington. However, no mention is made of any relationship with the Bureau. Ba ba ba! Kissinger! was FBI. Of course he was, but he was linked in with all of them. He was the guy who was threading. He was he was giving himself out to all different areas. But yeah, very much an establishment man, of course, and the Bureau is part of the establishment. So that's not too much of a surprise. There are bits in there that are really interesting, uh, some bits more than others. And th this... Uh, again, like I say, I would think that this was something to do with compromise. He, understanding that if he gave l information now, they would be able to use that later. This is the 50s. This is a time when you've got like um, uh, some of the worst people. You've got the McCarthy hearings and stuff, of course, uh, and, and other things happening that are causing masses of issues and there's lots of witch hunts going on and they're all looking for communists and Kissinger's well in that group. So we should probably, oh, sorry about that. We should probably also, oh, we're nearly going on. We got past here and here you go. There's Kissinger and there's Klaus Schwab in the middle and there's Ted Heath, dirty old Ted. Let's continue on this article. During World War II, whilst Kissinger was serving in the U.S. Counterintelligence Corps, he would be promoted to the rank of sergeant and would go on to serve in the military intelligence reserve for many years after peace was declared. During that period, Kissinger would take charge of the team hunting down Gestapo officers and other Nazi officials who had been labelled as saboteurs. After the war in 1946, Kissinger would be reassigned to teach at the European Command Intelligence School, a position he would continue to work in as a civilian after officially leaving the army. Here we go. 
1950, Kissinger would graduate from Harvard with a degree in political science where he would study under William Yandel Elliott, massive man who would eventually be a political advisor to six U.S. presidents and would also serve as a mentor to uh, Brzezinski and Pierre Trudeau, among others. Yandel Elliott, along with many of his star pupils, would serve as key connectors between the American National Security Establishment and the British Round Table Movement, embodied by organizations such as Chatham House in the UK and the Council on Foreign Relations in the United States. They would also seek to impose global power structures shared by big business, the political elite and academia. Kissinger would continue to study at Harvard, gaining his MA and PhD degree at the prestigious university. But he would also already he was also already trying to forge a career path in intelligence, uh, reportedly seeking recruitment as an FBI spy during this period. As we've just looked there, and then we get to the operations research. But I'm going to go back a sec. Whoop! Let's close that. Let's go and talk about this man. I'm down on a, a bi biography here of a man named William Yandel Elliott, American historian uh, for other people named William Yandel Elliott. Okay, William Elliott. Okay, William Yandel Elliott, born May the twelfth, eighteen ninety six, died nineteen seventy nine. Was an American historian and political advisor to six U.S. presidents. Born in Tennessee, he served as an artillery battery commander in World War I. He attended Vanderbilt University, where he was a member of the group of poets and literary scholars known as the Fugitives. These guys are really important, the Fugitives. If you go and look into them, they're extremely important too. As a Rhodes Scholar, yeah, already early Rhodes Scholar. This isn't like nowadays, there's lots of Rhodes Scholars still. But this is early Rhodes Scholars. Really important to note the early Rhodes Scholars. They are the movers and shakers of uh, what create the New World Order, Kissinger-style New World Order. He attended Balliol College, Oxford, where he read philosophy, political uh, politics and economics, PPE course, and among others would meet the poet William Butler Yeats, uh, the Indian nationalist Krishna Menon, uh, Menon uh, and John Marshall Harlan II, a future Ossiate Justice of the Supreme Court. His dissertation, The Pragmatic Revolt in Politics, completed under the supervision of A.D. Lindsay, proved to be influential. He was hired by Harvard President Abbott Lawrence Lowell, and he remained at Harvard for the next 41 years. He became an advisor to a number of American presidents and presidential candidates, including Al Smith in 1928. He was a member of Franklin Roosevelt's Brain Trust in the 1930s and 1940s, and the vice president of the War Production Board in charge of civilian requirements during World War II. He also accompanied Roosevelt in the Yalta Conference. Hmm, is that the, hmm, was the Yalta Conference the one in Tehran? Mm, that was uh, where they 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 travelled in a ship by uh, a guy called Quiggle who was co uh, uh, commanding the ship, and he later gets killed in what seems like a CIA operation. Very interesting. Anyway, um, after the war, Elliot served as national security count on National Security Council. He was a scriptwriter for the Republican R Richard Nixon's 1960 election run, but Democratic presidents John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson retained him as a U.S. State Department advisor. He also taught at Harvard Extension School. Elliot became dean of Harvard Summer School, where he would establish Harvard International Seminar, directed by his student and protege, Henry Kissinger. Many attendees went on to become heads of state of government and in their respective um, countries, including Yigal Alon um, in Israel, Yashuri uh, Nakasone in um, Japan, why is it, why it's got a star in AN, and Pierre Trudeau in um, Canada. And Klaus Schwab. They don't mention Klaus Schwab. Yeah, again, they don't. They always do this. They, what they omit is pretty important. One of his sons, Ward Elliott, is a notable political scientist. Other sons include late Charles Elliott and David Elliott, both political scientists. Now, also, William uh, Yandel Elliott 
is, I think, I personally think, going to be turn out to be related to Pierre Trudeau and the Trudeau family go back to the Elliots and you'll see um, mixed in I'm not going to keep going on about um, Yandel Elliot but he's an extremely important man you cannot tell I cannot tell you how important this man is but he's the one who helps create Kissinger's international seminar and there we're talking now we're talking in 1951 kissinger would be employed as a consultant for the army's operation research office where he would be trained in various forms of psychological warfare and here we go this is where kissinger becomes uh what he is you know what he is the beast that he is this psychological uh manipulator manipulate grand globalist manipulator This awareness of PSYOPs was reflected in his doctoral work during the period. His work on the Congress of Vienna and its consequences invoked thermonuclear war as its opening gambit, which also made an otherwise dull piece of work a little more interesting. It really did. It is a really dull piece of work. A lot of kids are just stuff is really dull. But then there's all like all of the nuclear apocalypse and stuff that comes with it. So that sparks it up a little bit. Uh, by 1954, Kissinger was hoping to become a junior professor at Harvard, but instead, the dean of Harvard at the time, George McBundy, and other pupil of William Yandel Elliot. George Bundy is so important. And I always could see uh, George McBundy because it seems normal. Um, recommended Kissinger to the Council on Foreign Relations. At the CFR, Kissinger would start managing a study group on nuclear weapons. From 1956 to 1958, Kissinger also became the director of special studies for the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. David Rockefeller was vice president of the CFR during this period, as well as going on to direct multiple panels to produce um, reports on national defense, which would gain international attention. In 1957, Kissinger would seal his place as a leading establishment figure on thermonuclear war after publishing Nuclear Weapons and Foreign Policy, a book published for the Council on Foreign Relations by Harp Brothers. Massively important. That paragraph is a very important paragraph. Um, you can see something really happens. William Yandel Elliott is, takes on Kissinger and says, <clears throat> you're going to run this international seminar at my summer school. He's a dean of the summer school. An international seminar was run at summer school. And in 1954, uh, it's McGeorge Bundy. It's, he didn't want to go to the FBI. That's not, it's, it, he wanted to be um, a professor at Harvard. And then he says, oh, no, you, you should go to the Council of Foreign Relations. I get that wrong. I forget about that. So I'm glad I, I, I reread this at this point. Um, and and the CFR is really mixed up with the Rockefeller. So the Council on Foreign Relations is a roundtable group that's uh, created like Chatham House, um, one of a Rhodesian style roundtable groups uh, that basically control, put out policy. Boring, extremely boring. You listen to them, they're falling asleep. But they their policy goes on to put other policy institutions into government. So they create the world we live in. And you don't even know they exist. Most, of most people don't even know they exist. But anyway, he was going to deployed as a consultant for the Army's Operational Research Office in 1951. And that leads him on to the Council of Foreign Relations and gaming out nuclear theory. So if we look at the, um, here, this is the Operations Research Office. Um, which is what, what he was part of, uh, which was a civilian military research center founded in 1948 by the United States Army, was run under contract by John Hopkins University and regarded as one of the founding institutes of operation research and interdisciplinary science. The organization's offices were originally at Fort McNair, Washington, D.C. They moved to Chevy Chase, Maryland in 1952. In 1961, the Army discontinued John Hopkins University contract and the o uh, ORO was dissolved. So he was part of this. Um, and the rock, and that was established by the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, a, a philanthropic uh, foundation created and run by members of the Rockefeller family, it was founded in New York City in 1940. Bloody bloody blah, blah, blah. As you see down here, we'll go down a little bit. 
So the special studies project from 1956 to 1960, really massively important. The fund financed a study conceived by then President Nelson Rockefeller, who goes on to be um, very instrumental in Nixon's campaign and to get Kissinger. He wanted to get Kissinger. Rockefeller wanted to get Kissinger in the White House. Didn't care where. He was desperate for Kissinger to be in the White House. He, When he finally did, he was like, third time. We did it on the third attempt. You know, Nelson Rockefeller was up there, really found it massively important for Kissinger um, to be in the White House. Needed him in there. Needed him. Um, to analyze challenges faced to the, facing the United States, Henry Kissinger was recruited to direct the project. Seven, seven panels were constitu constituted that looked at issues including military strategy, foreign policy, international economic strategy, governmental reorganization, and nuclear arms race. The military sub-panels report was rush released about two months after USSR launched Sputnik in October 1957. Rockefeller urged the report Republican Party to adopt the finding of the Special Studies Program as its platform. The findings of the project formed the framework of Nelson Rockefeller's 1960s presidential election platform. The project was published uh, in its entirety uh, in 1961 as Prospect for America, the Rockefeller Panel Report. It was a very interesting report. I've read that one. That's very interesting. Um, what they what, what they're pushing for. The archival study papers are stored at the Rockefeller Archival Center um, at the family estate and presidents, as you see, a couple of Rockefellers and some few other people now. Few other people now. So and there you are. This is it. Written in uh, 1957 by Henry Kissinger. And look, it says by Henry Kissinger, born 1923. And it's got the hyphen. 2023! He's dead! Today! He died today! Yeah! So this is Henry Kissinger. Nuclear weapons and foreign policy. I always say nuclear war and foreign policy. I always forget it's nuclear weapons and foreign policy. I can't help it. Um, but this was massively important. This was out after gaming out all of this stuff behind closed doors of CFR's little Rockefeller fund, fund uh, funded organization. And, and it says here, um, now that these uh, exist weapons, now that there exist weapons uh, capable of destroying humanity, I'm trying to get my Kissinger voice, our nation's survival depends on our ability to find answers to, to operations. What challenges should be resisted by force? How can we be resisted without being... Anyway, massively important Um Oh, let me just uh, borrow it. Oh, I've not borrowed it, so he's going to have to probably do it again. Um, massively important piece of work. Changed human history. If you, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of books out there that that do big things. This is a, a book that didn't just do big things. It changed human history in a way that was fundamental. It's loads of it. Our 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 world we live in today was partly brought on by this era of thinking where you had perpetual limited warfare uh, be created as an idea for a principle for future wars and mutually assured destruction being um, uh, an idea of why there's not going to be a large nuclear war because if you do then you're going to be destroyed so it, 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 there's no point in starting out and as you see with nuclear weapons and foreign policy this is Henry Kissinger's book you 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 literally turn the first page and you've got um, uh, some public, uh, publications by the Council on Foreign Relations. It shows a load of publications by the Council on Foreign Relations. It shows you it's published by the Council on Foreign Relations. And the first page shows you the Council on Foreign Relations is a non-profit institution devoted to the study of international aspects of American political, economic and strategic problems. It takes no stand, yes it does, expressed or implied or um, on American policy. Yes it does because it puts people like Henry Kissinger into making those policies. It's such a lie. The author of this book published under the auspices of the Council are responsible for their statements of Fact and special opinion, bloody bloody blah. Now here, look, 
Look at this. Cancel on foreign relations. And it shows you on the first pages of Henry Kissinger's like big work that he puts out because he's already written a fair, you know, he's written some long, long pieces by this point. But this is really important. Nuclear weapons and foreign policy is one of the most important books in history. Look. Who? Chairman of the board, John J. McCloy, named once in one work as the head of the New World Order in 1968-1967. He was extremely important, McCloy, a CFR member of the highest order, present uh, at the opening, um, Harvard's opening of the German Marshall Fund in 1972-1973, um, which was a really just... A, a reinstitution, a, 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 a second attempt at making the international seminar. So, uh, McCloy is extremely uh, important person within history. And of course, Vice President David Rockefeller down there. David, Dave, the man Dave. You are right, Dave. What are you doing? Oh, controlling the world is it? Oh, what a surprise! Yeah, and there's something. Those guys are big, and of course, you you could see. I mean, it, it's. This is a, a massively comprehensive piece of work. This is unbelievable piece of work. Henry Kissinger is a piece of work, or was. I died today. Ah, fold Henry. No more Henry. The problems of survival. Such a Henry Kissinger uh, lines, right? So, so this was really important because it looked at what nuclear weapons meant because everybody was panicking about them and though everybody was panicking about them a lot of the panic was for nothing of course because just right if you're both standing opposite each other with machine guns do you fire the machine guns at each other when you get angry at each other that would be uh you know likely to uh so someone's going to lose and someone's going to die so it's, Someone's going to get shot. Two people, someone's going to get shot. What if you both had bombs that meant that as soon as you hit the other person, you died as well? This is what what it really come to. is no longer will we fight in firefights where you point a gun at someone and shoot, and then it's a chance that you're going to shoot. Or it's not no longer the time of swords or pikes where your certain number of your troops are going to be killed by a certain number of their troops, and it all depends on armor and other things. This was a time of mutually assured destruction, which would of course uh, be posited a few years later after this, about four years later, by Herman Town. I think it's nineteen sixty one. Um, the um, Herman Kahn produces on thermonuclear war, which really Kissinger and Kahn, their work around this time are heavily related and heavily connected uh, to trying to establish the same sort of, I don't know if the words fear, but trepidation about um, what's happening while at the same time trying to calm fears down amongst the intellectual class a lot of the um working class middle or the american middle class and british working class whatever you want to call it um those people wouldn't really understand what this meant uh they wouldn't be taught it in schools they wouldn't be given it in newspapers that often it would be the intellectuals who understand what this meant and they would be the ones who would then calm slowly calm down other people but they they, they knew they they never let out the dynamic at the time uh how that could you know they 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 had already worked this out this had already been long in the making and the actions to counter counteract this would have already been started before this had come out this is a reoccurring theme they already know this sort of stuff kissinger's the mouthpiece for uh all of their studies and gaming out where nuclear weapons and foreign policy is going but their actions it's like for instance, in 1967, 1966, 1967, Herman Kahn releases a Hudson Institute report on, um, which includes a chapter on um, training leadership groups outside normal society and his young global leaders in Kissinger's International Seminar. But it's explaining it when he already knows Kissinger's International Seminar. He's already been, he's already the mentor for Klaus Schwab at this point so he's already you know they know this exists and they're saying afterwards 
oh, this needs to happen because they're doing it in secret behind closed doors. The test is working out and then they need to legitimize it in the real world and manufacture consent. And so then they say to the real world, oh, yeah, you need to we need to do this. And then they say, oh, we need to do this. And then they do it legitimately or supposedly legitimately. And it takes time, takes time to manufacture consent. Consent is not manufactured overnight, my friend. Consent is not manufactured overnight. Massively important work of history is nuclear weapons and foreign policy. Massively important. Changed the world. Changed the world. So go back. That was uh, that section there. The next section. In December of 1966, the Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs, John M. Leddy, announced the formation of a 22-man panel of advisers to help uh, shape European policy. The five most prominent actors of this panel of advisers included Henry A. Kissinger, representing Harvard, Robert Osgood of the Washington Center of Foreign Policy Research, funded by Ford, Rockefeller and Carnegie Money, Melvin Conant of the Rockefeller Standard Oil, War uh, Warner L. R. Schilling of Columbia University, and Raymond Vernon, who was also of Harvard. The other people on the panel included four members of the Council of Foreign Relations, Shepard Stone of the Ford Foundation, with the rest being a mix of representatives from leading American universities. The forming of this panel could be considered as uh, the laying of the proverbial foundation stone marking the American branch of the Roundtable establishment, intent to create an organization such as a World Economic Forum, whereby Anglo-American imperialists would mold European policy as the they saw fit. Ooh, what a sentence. And if you look at this, this is really important to understand. The reason why I'm telling you this is that nuclear war and foreign policy has come out and it, Kissinger has become uh, a leading establishment figure on thermonuclear war. And by December 1966, uh, he's now one of the main people who's looking at how to reshape European policy. So looking over at Europe, because that's the key, isn't it? If there's going to be a nuclear war, it's not going to be fought in America or in Russia. It's going to be fought in Europe, isn't it? So they're already trying to change European foreign policy, policy. But there's another much more important and much more. We've seen we've seen the results now. They were looking at taking over as much of the Soviet-controlled Europe as possible. The Cold War had to end up being a ground war. Eventually, sentiment had to be changed uh, by using psychological tactics on the European mainland in Eastern Europe so that you would see what we eventually saw, which was the colour revolution, starting with the Velvet Revolution in 1989 and going on through each of the CIA backed through NGO coups in all the different Eastern European countries that, that uh, coincided with the, the fall of the Soviet, uh, of Soviet Russia. The, the, that had to be created, that had to be moulded and, and figured out and mapped out. And this is the period when they were mapping it out. This is the 60s, the mid-60s and the late 60s was when they really were like, OK, these are the group of people, these bunch of Council on Foreign Relations and Rockefeller-aligned people who are all going to decide on what this is. So so let's have a, a little look. We can see this is the original, this is from December the 16th, 1966 in the New York Times, uh, and 22 uh, named, and they, they name all of the people, all of the, these different people, including the study headed by John J. McCloy. Of course, like you saw, saw earlier, um, John J. McCloy it was uh, chairman of the CFR. So they, they're not mentioning, the CFR is not mentioned, the Council on Formulation, how many is it meant at the Centre of Foreign Policy? No, is this, ah, there's Council on Foreign Relations, Council on Foreign Relations, Council on Foreign Relations, Council on Foreign Relations. So there's four that's mentioned as Council on Foreign Relations and then 
not so much the rest. But most of them are linked with them. So this is a CFR. The CFR are creating policy in the CFR that's then going to be instituted into European, uh, given to European leaders. And these European leaders are going to be trained through Harvard's International Seminar and other co such courses. And they're going to have an American line, are going to be put into power, and they're going to take on American policy. So America grooms the European leaders, put, gives them the power, gives them the support to put them in power coos their country if necessary gets NGOs eventually to uh, exert that CAA power because after the 1960s uh, and 50s and all of this uh, turns out to be CIA funded and that comes out in the papers they have to then create things that will be like a separate uh, proxy for CIA money um, such things as USAID and other things um, ways to uh, detach the CIA CIA from the funding of such things. So this is this is the European policy group that's created in 19 and some of them like this is uh Osgood who's in it, uh US Army, of course. At Harvard, Harvard, Harvard. Um and look at some of the, the books that he's uh, Ideals of Self Interest and American Foreign Relations, um limited war the challenge to american strategy again limited war the limited warfare was really what was coming out during that time um executive summit limited war so limited warfare went alongside what kissinger was thinking so these guys were working in the same policy institute doing the same things at the same time and created creating uh manufacturing the consent for their version of how the world's going to go and uh, here, Melvin Conant is one of the guys who uh, was on this. And here is an example of one of his works, of course, The Long Polar Watch, Canada and the Defense of North America. So you can see each of them had their own little areas of expertise. Uh, this was Warner R. Schilling's scientific contributions. Look at some of this. Super Bomb, Organizational Conflict and the Development of the Hydrogen Bomb. He's uh, included, he's noted in there but I, I suppose you'd have to go back to his earlier works um was only nine there he's mentioned shock of the new world more than these are all citations anyway so he's cited in lots of articles that are about the super bomb and Raymond Vernon, he's another one. And this is very interesting. He's another very interesting person. Why are these people involved? Well, Professor Emerit Emeritus of Kennedy School of Government in the United States. Kennedy School of Government, isn't that uh, in Harvard? I think it is. Uh, Honors City College, uh, Doctor um Product life cycle theory. In 1959, Raymond Vernon joined Harvard Business School as faculty director. There he set up the large multinational enterprise research to study the directions from uh st to study the direction from the United States. Product life cycle theory. So he, very interesting. Here we go. This is this is how interesting this guy is and how important he is. A product life cycle theory. The research team looked at aspects of terms of finance, organization, production, management, marketing, and business government relations. This produced several theories, including that of product life cycle. Um, in the course of the time, Vernon wrote several books and articles about multinational management, uh, doing business in other countries, relations with government, etc. According to The Economist, 1999, he is still regarded as the discoverer of globalization. That's massively important when they're creating global world, training global leaders of the future, impl implanting them into the country, having them implement American-aligned policy. Uh, do that, one of the advisors is regarded as a discoverer of globalization, of course. In 1981, v Raymond Vernon transferred to the Kennedy School of Government, a central figure between uh, business and government, and continues to research in the area of globalization. Oh, died at the age of 86. Number one, of course, old people die. A Shepherd Stone was one of them, described in uh, 1990 in his uh, obituary in the New York Times as um, a diplomat, a journalist, and a philanthropist. Uh, Dr. Shepard Stone, who was distinguished career in journalism, diplomacy, and philanthropy, uh, died of a heart attack on Friday while um, driving from his home in South Newfane, uh, Vermont. I think that's Vermont. Um, 
to a conference in Dartmouth College. He was 82 years old. Uh, I, very interesting. He he wrote the book Shadow Over Europe, The Challenge of Nazi Germany. From 1942 until 1946, he served in army in Europe. Of course he did. And then he became director of the Ford Foundation in 1953. And there you go. He had been honorary chairman of the McCloy Scholarship Program, John J. McCloy Scholarship Program at John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. Um, so he, obviously you can see what type of guy Shepard Stone is and the type of influence he has. Worth knowing who's the type of people who are writing our future history. And not long after that 22 man was reformed, a 22-man unit was reformed. Another uh, 29 American authorities in Germany have signed a statement declaring that recent state elections in West Germany do not indicate a rebirth in Nazism. The statement, made public by the American Council on Germany, included also warned against the danger of condemning an entire people for the views of a small minority. The Council at 99 Park Avenue is a non-profit organization that promotes friendship between the United States and Germany. Among the signers of the statement were two former undersecretaries of state, Robert Murphy and Charles E. Saltzman, and two former members of President Dwight, Eisen, D. I, uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower's Council of Economic Advisers, Professor Carl Brandt of Stanford University, University Professor Henry C. Wallach of Yale. Other signers included Dr. E um, George N. Schuster, former president of Hunter's College, uh, and J Hans J. Morgenthau, and of course, Henry Kissinger, uh, and a few others. I wanted to mention Hans J. Morgenthau. He's an extremely, like, if if you've got futurists, people looking into the future um, who are in power in these sort of positions, you really should watch them at this era in the 60s. They're, they're really important. Um, Hans Morgenthau was one of those guys. Another German-born American political scientist and historian noted as leading analyst of the role of power in international politics. Educated first in Germany in the universities of Berlin and Frankfurt and Munich, Morgan Fau did postgraduate work in the Graduate Institute for International Studies in Geneva. He was admitted to the bar in 1927 and served acting president at a labor law court in Frankfurt. In 1932, he went to Geneva to teach public law for a year, but because of Adolf Hitler's rise to power in Germany in 1933, he he stayed on until 1935. In 1935 to 1936, he taught in Madrid. 1937, took up residency in the United States, where he became naturalized citizen in 1943. He served on the faculties of uh, Brooklyn College, blah, 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 blah. Um, in 1948, Morgenthau published Politics Among Nations, a highly regarded study that presented what became commonly known as a classical realist approach to international politics. In this work, Morgenthau maintained that politics is governed by distinct immutable laws of nature and that the states should, could uh, deduce rational and objectively correct actions from understanding of these laws. Central to Morgenthau's theory was the concept of power as the dominant goal in the international politics and the definition of national interests in terms of power. His state center approach, which was refused to which refused to identify the moral aspirations of a state with the um, objective moral laws that govern the universe, maintained that all state actions seek to keep, demonstrate, or increase power. He called for recognition of the nature and limits of power and for the use of traditional methods of diplomacy, including compromise. So important, that last one, he called for recognition of the nature and limits of power and for the use of traditional methods of diplomacy, including compromise. And Morgan Fow, out of all of those people who have mentioned in that newspaper, is one of the only ones who believes in compromise, including a little bit Eisenhower, but Eisenhower is a strange one, really strange one. I, I, not all he seems, he warns about the military industrial complex while helping create the military industrial complex. I, I believe that some people have such a complex uh, part in history. And this is Morgan Fowl. Um, this is a Morgan Fowl book here. Um, it's called Scientific Man versus Political Power, although uh, I need to borrow it again by the looks of it. Um, 
Here we go. And it was written in 1965. He's another one who was born just past the turn of the century. Hmm. The page. Ah, there you go. So Hans J. Morgan Powell, Scientific Man versus Power Politics. A brilliant attack on dogmatic uh, uh, scientism on, in the field of politics. And here you go. That's a, a wonderful picture on the front. You got a library card. That's nice. And uh, oh, it's taking a while to load these things. Archives a bit slow tonight, but you can't can't get them wrong. They they do well. Um, so this is a really interesting book, though, because it looks at science uh, and the future. Um, the science of Peter, but uh, it's a really he's a really interesting guy. Morgan Fow, someone who I want to look into much more. Um really interesting anyway those are some of the people who were involved in uh two various places in two various committees or groups uh in looking at how the future should be created one in europe and one in general um and it was an extremely important time um henry kissinger was being seen as someone really important during this period of course uh post-war europe was at a vital stage of its development and powerful American empire was beginning to see opportunities in the rebirth of Europe and the emerging identity of its younger generation. In late December of 1966, Kissinger would be one of the 29 American authorities in Germany to sign a statement declaring that recent state elections in West Germany do not indicate rebirth of Nazism. The document was also signed by the likes of Dwight Eisenhower as meant to signal that Europe was starting afresh and was meant to begin putting the horrors of European wars in the past. Some of the people involved in creating the aforementioned document were those who had already been externally influencing European policy from abroad. Notably, one of the signatures alongside Kissinger and Eisenhower was Professor Hans J. Morgenfau, who was represent who was also representing the Council on Foreign Relations at the time. Very strange because he's like very left wing for the Council on Foreign Relations, I find. Um same same could be said of John Kenneth Galbraith, who who's who's uh bioed later um morgan Fowle had famously written a paper entitled scientific man versus power politics and argued against the over reliance on science and technology um as solutions to political and social problems that's very interesting his view on science technology and futurism is like much more classically driven let's go back to the classics so he's a very interesting person to study because he's obviously his idea and this is why it's very that that the over reliance on science and technology as solutions to political and social problems that is what the other option was at this time one option was morgan fow don't rely on that and the other option was kissinger schwab let's create that Let's make it so AI exists. Let's do all of this, head towards every single potential technological advance regardless so that we can change um, political and social. We can find solutions for political and social problems. But political and social problems are often to do with relating um, relations and truth and humanity and technology takes away a lot of that humanity. It could be said, along with a lot of other things that it does. In February 1967, Henry Kissinger would target European policy making as having been the reason for a century of war and politi political turmoil on the continent. In a piece entitled Fuller Investigation, printed in New York Times, Kissinger would state that a work by Raymond Aron, Peace and War, A Theory of International Relationships, had reminded some of these issues. In this article, Kissinger would write, in the United States, the national style is pragmatic. The tradition until World War II was largely isolationist. isolationist. The approach to peace and war tended to be absolute and legalistic. American writing on foreign policy had generally tended to fall into three categories. Analysis of specific cases or historical episodes exhaustions justifying or resisting greater participation in international affairs, an investigation of the legal basis of world order. Don't want to mention world order, Kissinger. They'll start calling us all conspiracy theories. Theorists. 
It was clear that Professor Henry A. Kissinger had identified American involvement in European policy creation as being vital in the future peace and stability of the world. At this time, Kissinger was based at Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Here, the future founder of the World Economic Forum, a young Klaus Schwab, would catch the eye of Henry Kissinger. Oh, yes, he would. You, uh, He was a uh... sexual healing. Kissinger was an executive director of the International Seminar. Yes, he was. Let's get rid That's full explanation. That was the article Henry Kissinger wrote in the New York Times. Look at, look at that. The twisted knot of international relations. Um, and Harvard program. Here you go. Yeah. Oh, we're getting it. Kissinger was executive director of the International Seminar, which Schwab often mentions when recollecting his time spent at Harvard. On the 16th of April 1967, it would be reported that various Harvard programs had been receiving funding from the Central Intelligence Agency. This included $135,000 of funding for Henry Kissinger's international seminar. Funding, which Kissinger claimed he was unaware had come from the U.S. intelligence agency. Yeah, whatever. You get, like, funded. Oh, like, what's equivalent now to, what, million, two million, three million, four million, something like that. Oh, no, I don't know. Where did it come from? Oh, it just, just turned up in the bank account, didn't it? Oh, Henry Kissinger. Don't care who gives me the money. Just keep walking forward. The CIA's involvement in funding Kissinger's international seminar was exposed in a report by Humphrey Dorman, the assistant to Franklin L. Ford, who was the Dean of Faculty of Arts and Science. Humphrey Dorman's report, written in 1967, only centred on the CIA funding from between 1961 to 1966, but Kissinger's International Seminar, which had received most funding out of all the CIA-funded Harvard programmes, would still run through 1967. Klaus Schwab arrived at Harvard in 1965, so he spent two years on the International Seminar, a CIA-funded course. But boom, when I found this, when I, I had to look for ages and ages, I'd like, I was, I was spent a year, a year of research. And then I come across this article and my jaw dropped. I nearly, my balls fell out <laughs> just straight right on the floor. Like, oh my God. No, really. Harvard programs helped CIA, um, uh, Harvard programs received CIA help. Cambridge, Massachusetts, April 15th, UPI. A Harvard University report shows that 13 programs at the university received a total of $456,000 in funds from organizations acting as conduits for the Central Intelligence Agency. The report released yesterday was made by Humphrey Dorman, assistant to Franklin L. Ford, Dean of the Faculties of Arts and Sciences. Mr. Ford, who succeeded former presidential advisor Mr. J McGeorge Bundy as dean, said no strings were attached to the funds. McGeorge Bundy was the guy who was like mentoring Kissinger at Harvard a lot of the time and put him into to, to a lot of this stuff. So it's brilliant that he was like, oh yeah, he, he, of course he, of course he was in with it. Um, CFR guy as well. The report said that the funds were given uh, to programs and to individual professors in the departments of psychology, philosophy, and social relations for research from 1960 to 1966. Didn't mention before. The programs included the International Seminar at the Summer School. Henry A. Kissinger's executive director of the seminar acknowledged receiving the $135,000. Mr. Kissinger said he was unaware that the intelligence agency had given partial support to the seminar. <laughs> the report said 15 organizations had been involved in channeling funds to the school. 15 organizations, which included the Farfield Foundation, the Asian Foundation, and the American Friends of the Middle East. American Friends of the Middle East, who supplied most of the money to uh, the international seminar was headed by Kermit Roosevelt Jr., the grandson of Theodore Roosevelt. And um, it's uh, that that comes up very much covers in the Kissinger continuum, um, yeah, uh, uh, the unofficial um, story of the young creation of the young global leaders. Uh, pro program. This was such an important piece. This New York Times piece was written along with another piece in another magazine. I can't remember the name of. Um, uh, they were they were about to report it, and Harvard find out found out, and so they got Humphrey Dorman 
they quickly got Humphrey Dorman to write a report. And now if you look at Humphrey Dorman's page on Harvard Crimson, you find a few things, but they're all like 1950 and 1951. They're all, they're, that, that's it. The earliest ones from March 13th, 1950, the latest ones from March 22nd, so you can't find it. But if you look around enough, you see that no writer attributed, no one wanted to take the note for this, but Harvard Crimson released on uh, April 15th, 1967, CIA financial links. Humphrey Dorman's report on CIA financing um, gave the university a clean bill of health almost. <laughs> Dorman, assigned by Dean Ford to investigate possible CIA influence, told the faculty Tuesday that Central Intelligence uh, Agency Conduit Foundations have channeled $456,000 in the university from 1960 to 1966. Conduit Foundations, unlike so-called dummy organizations, do not receive all their money from the CIA, and therefore is n- there is no proof that the agency's dollars actually went to the university. Sneaky! There were no strings attached to the aid, so the government could not directly influence research or prevent its result from being published. Yeah, no obvious links, apart from Henry Kissinger just sitting about there. Um, yet, the, despite uh, the belief of many professors that the CIA had no voice in Harvard projects, uh, this financial link was potentially dangerous. The degree of control the CIA exercised over the conduits is unknown, and there is no absolute guarantee that the agency was not able to influence research, subject matter, and personal uh, personnel through the officials of these foundations. So it says that after saying there were no strings attached, the government cannot directly influence. But there's no evidence that the government cannot directly influence them because they probably were. <laughs> Dean Ford had observed um, that in the future, the faculty may have to decide whether to take funds from Central Intelligence Agency for clearly specified unclassified research. When that question arises, he told his colleagues, the faculty should try not to make blanket classifications of government agencies as to, uh, to the acceptability of their funds. Rather, it should be appraised the individual terms of each grant proposal. Basically, it said, don't worry if Epstein wants to give you money. Take it. The CIA may indeed make more use of the direct and open grants from university now that President Johnson has forbidden the agency to work through the conduits. But if the formula for these government aid uh, to academic projects is now to be open, it is unlikely that the CIA, uh, by its secretive nature, would make such grants. If it should offer Harvard a grant for some specified work, Ford's proposal makes good sense. It would allow the university to determine um, at that time whether the terms the CIA offer did not undermine the credibility of Harvard as a haven for disinterested academic research. In any case, where the university, were the university, and this is a brilliant line, this is a, remember this one, in any case, were the university to refuse to accept CIA research grants, the shadowy agency would have little trouble channeling the offers for another agency. So again, it's like it's like oh, he, if we didn't accept it, they just find another way. So we may as well accept it. May as well, why not? So that was um, their admittance, and they were only admitting it because their hands were forced by these newspaper reporters. And we're coming up to the end now. Thank you for joining in with me on this. Uh, on such a good day uh, as the day Henry Kissinger died. <laughs> Sorry to laugh about someone's death, but it's Henry Kissinger, so it's fine! <laughs> On the 15th of April 1967, the Harvard Crimson would publish an article attributed to no author. Concerning Dorman's report stated there were no strings attached to the aid, so the government could not directly influence research or prevent its results from being published. The dismissive article entitled CIA Financial Links nonchalantly closes out by stating in any case, were the university to refuse to accept CIA research grants, the shadowy agency would have little trouble channeling its offers through other um, aggressy. Another aggressy, sorry. Aggressy being a pun, meaning a form of intelligence. So another form of intelligence, of course. I read agency automatically, but I remember writing that and going, aggressy, oh, it's a pun for intelligence. Because uh, CIA uh, intelligence. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it's Harvard, you know. Oh, it wouldn't matter anyway. They wouldn't, we're so intelligent. <laughs> they have to come to us, intelligence. <laughs> 
The evidence points to Klaus Schwab having been recruited by Kissinger into a circle of round table imperialists via CIA funded program at Harvard University. Patoo! That's knocking it out of the park. In addition, the year he graduated would also be the year in which it was revealed to have been a CIA funded program. <laughs> oh, timing. That's what makes a punchline. Uh, this CIA funded seminar would introduce Schwab to the extremely well connected American policymakers who would help him create what would become the most powerful university, European public policy institute, the World Economic Forum. By 1969, Kissinger would be sitting as the head of the U.S. National Security Council, of which the sitting president, Richard Nixon, would enhance the importance of during his administration. Kissinger was assistant to the president for national security affairs between the 2nd of February 1968 to the 3rd of November 1975, serving concurrently as Richard Nixon's secretary of state from 22nd of September 1973. Kissinger would dominate the making of U.S. foreign policy during the Nixon era, and the system he would bring to the National Security Council would seek to combine features of the systems previously implemented by Eisenhower and Johnson. Henry Kissinger, who had been one of the people to manufacture tensions between thermonuclear powers over the previous two, de two decades, was now to act as peacemaker during the Nixon period. He would turn his focus to the European standoff and would seek to relax the tensions between West and Russia. He negotiated the strategic arms limitation talks culminating in SALT-1 treaty and the anti-ballistic missile treaty. Kissinger was attempting to rebrand himself as a trusted statesman and diplomat. Uh, and behind the scenes, he was messing around intelligence-wise and making sure that coups happened and other things happened. Amazing. I've done, I, I've, I found some amazing stuff that I'm going to produce eventually that's about Kissinger um, and, and some of what comes after the international seminar that's really just mind-blowing. But we'll get to that. Um, just to uh, talk about that, though, this was the strategic arms, which was uh, during the late 1960s, the United States learned that the Soviet Union had embarked upon a massive intercontinental ballistic missile buildup designed to uh, reach parity with the United States. In fact, in the 60s, they, they um, tested, the Russians tested the biggest uh, nuclear bomb so far, and that really shook things up. People were like, okay, it's just getting to the point where if we keep going down this front, they are going to destroy us, and we are going to destroy them. Um, also did a lot of research as a good news hound on that which is about um herman khan's war uh if you it's about episode eight of news hound around there um and that's got, got some really interesting takes on um how they viewed um nuclear war during that period and of course there was the um anti-ballistic missile treaty as well um which uh happened in in during that period of course kissinger was heavily involved in these things and i say he was trying to be um a peacemaker but th th this was summed up in his address given in new york in uh 23rd of april 1973 here um which is linked in the article um and this really looks at the reformation of what what the world under kissinger would look like and it sounds very conciliatory in tone and very peaceful in tone this whole document it's not long it's only six pages um it sets out a lot that that you really understand okay this is what he wants us to look at him like but this isn't what he's like he was an intelligence manipulator he was manipulating behind the scenes and uh and there's some very interesting things from it <laughs> uh i mean we're talking about the u.s and uk special relationship he's talking about here American leaders saw it to be in their self-interest to obtain British advice before taking major decisions. It was an extraordinary relationship because it rested on no legal claim. It was formalised by no document. It was carried forward by succeeding British governments as if no alternatives were conceivable. Britain's influence uh, was great precisely because it never insisted on it. The special relationship demonstrated the value of intangibles. Next, him talking about the special relationship with the UK, of course, which was a partnership that uh, has helped mould the American 
um, world as well. And that document there talks about a, a, the European relationship with America. And that document there talks about the European relationship um, a bit as well. On the second term of President Richard Nixon's administration, their attention would turn to relations with Western Europe. Richard Nixon would describe 1973 as being the year of Europe. He did it. The United States' focus would be on supporting the states of the European economic community, which had become economic rivals to the U.S. by the early 1970s. Kissinger grasped the Year of Europe concept and pushed on a uh, pushed an agenda not only of economic reform but also arguing to strengthen and revitalize what he considered to be a decaying force, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Throughout his this period, Kissinger would also promote global governance. Again, that document we looked at just then quickly, um, which is called um, a strained partnership. Uh, US UK um, relations in the era of the detente uh, 1969 to 1977 and this looks at Henry Kissinger pushing the European the forming of entry into the EEC and using US UK relations um, to do that uh, and it being the centerpiece US and UK relations in actual fact Herman Kahn during this period um, who was working with all these guys were also stating the same saying that um us and uk relationships um would be the most important parts um so um kissinger 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 anyway let's come out that's about european management anyway years later Henry Kissinger would make opening address of the World Economic Forum's 1980s conference, telling the elites of Davos, for the first time in history, foreign policy is truly global. That was what that last link was. It was actually looking for the, the Henry Kissinger quote at the first Davos, saying for the first time in history, foreign policy is truly global. Now, this article isn't just got the bio of Henry Kissinger in, of course. It talks about the people who Henry Kissinger gave at uh, the Harvard International Seminar to Klaus Schwab to be his uh, American handlers, really, to go back to create the World Economic Forum, to get Ghana support to create the World Economic Forum, which first ran in 1971 in January. And John Kenneth Galbraith, again, as important as Kissinger, I'd say, uh, in so many different ways. Herman Kahn, again, given to him, one of the most important men in history. There's Herman Kahn, as Dominic Rumsfeld, and there's, of course, Gerald Ford. Uh, Herman Kahn is extremely interesting, extremely important. Hudson Institute, and these are Schwab's three mentors. Kahn, Kissinger, and Galbraith have become three of the most influential people in American history uh, with regards to thermonuclear deterrence, foreign policy creation, and public policy making, respectively. Most of the focus throughout these men's careers had been on Europe and the Cold War. However, their varying roles in other important events of the period have ha all have uh, potential to easily distract research from other more subversive and well-hidden events. These three powerful Americans were all linked with each other in various ways, but one interesting notable thread in particular ties these men together during this period between 1966 and the creation of Kissinger's le the Kissinger-led 22-man po panel of advisors to help shape European policy through to 1971 and the founding of the World Economic Forum. All three men were members of the Council on Foreign Relations, the American branch of the Anglo-American Imperialist Round Table Movement. Kissinger already had deep ties to the CFR having been recruited by them straight after graduation. Galbraith had reportedly reassigned his, uh, resigned his membership of the CFR in a highly public way in 1972, stating that the CFR was boring and telling a journalist most of the proceedings involve a level of banality so deep that the only question they raise is whether they sh you should sit through them. Although there's no public date where Vigal, oh, of when Galbraith became a member of the CFR, he had written for the publication from as early as July 1958 with rival economic theories to India being printed in Foreign Affairs, the official CFR journal magazine. Khan um, could also be found uh, publish, uh, publishing some of his essays through the CFR, writing a piece, Alton to view uh, um, Europe in July uh, 1966, and if negotiation fails, in uh, July 1968, both whilst working at official advisors at the State Department, a State Department occupied by Kissinger, of course. Um, 
Let's skip through a little bit of this. To Galbraith and Kissinger, and also to the wider American political establishment, Europe was a main threat to not only global stability, but also to the prevailing American hegemony in general. The relative stability in Europe during the post-war period was perceived as being due to thermonuclear standoff, and from very early on, Kissinger identified this dynamic as, and began to manipulate the situation for the benefit of American supremacy. Henry Kissinger was not alone in trying to understand the complex dynamics at play in the relationship to thermonuclear war deterrence and how it affected policy making. Herman Kahn was leading figure on thermonuclear strategic planning during the same period, and Kissinger's work concerning the same subject matter from the mid-50s onwards would see him cross paths with Kahn on many occasions. Khan offered Kissinger something which all politicians and policymakers crave, the ability to predict the future events with relative accuracy. Khan was a veritable prophet concerning the technological advancements of not-so-distant future, and his work, although often stoic and bereft of human emotion, has stood up very well to the test of time. Kahn and Kissinger's goal will overlap during the mid and late 1960s, as the threat assessment of Kahn made during this period became more optimistic. Kissinger would see Kahn's work as being fundamental, uh, being as being fundamental in offering a new future to the people of the world. However, Henry Kissinger's vision of the future was not of a free and fair society advancing into a brave new world together, but rather Kissinger intended to create an image of the world which had been skewered by his own CFR-driven establishment perspective. Although he would attempt to rebrand himself as a true statesman, Kissinger would continue to subvert not only foreign democ democratic processes, but also to undermine the American system for the eventual benefit of globalist agenda. When Schwab was first recognized by Kissinger's potential future globalist leader, the relatively young German would soon be introduced to Galbraith and Kahn. This would coincide with Kahn's work identifying the need to specifically train individuals with leadership potential separately from those who attended prevailing standard educational models. And there you go. It's, uh, there's, uh, that's a lot about Kissinger within the article. Um, and I, I, I say, is Klaus Schwab really... The, the real brains behind a full mention of the World Economic Forum. Uh, what are we to make from the CIA involvement in seminar Kissinger used to recruit Schwab? Were the powers that lurk behind the organizations like the CFR the real founders of the globalist policy or uh, of the globalist policy making organization? Was the World Economic Forum meant to simply unite Europe, or was it actually meant to go and unite Europe with America? followed by the remaining superstates into the New World Order designed by the powerful CFR grandees like Kissinger, Khan, and Galbraith. Well, you can go and read that article yourself. It is a cracker. It ends with when hell of a, 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 a um, from Hudson Institute um, policy document the ancillary pilot study for educational policy research program final report, which includes the suggestion of educating um, groups outside um, normal educational means, usual educational means. And, and one of the lines that Khan writes, um, I just, I've read it so many times, so powerful. It has become increasingly clear that our technological and even our economic achievements are mixed blessings. Through progress, issues arise such as the accumulation, augmentation and proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, the loss of privacy and solitude, the increase of governmental and or private power over individuals, the loss of human scale and perspective and the dehumanization of social life or even the psychobiological self. The growth of dangerously vulnerable, deceptive, or degradable centralizations of administrative or technological systems. The creation of other new capabilities, so inherently dangerous as to seriously risk disastrous abuse, and the acceleration of changes that are too rapid or cataclysmic to permit successful adjustment. Perhaps most crucial, choices are posed that are too large, complex, important, uncertain, or comprehensive to be safely left
to fallible humans. I love that. Love it. Love it. And that was an important moment in my life, writing that article, researching that article, finding out that it was a CIA-funded course, revealing that Klaus Schwab had been trained through a Kissinger-led CIA-funded course was like, that's a pinnacle stuff. That's this, this, It's your dream to come up with an article where you can find the evidence that proves that someone like um, Klaus Schwab had gone, actually gone through a CIA-funded course to actually find that was so important to me, so important to my life. And Kissinger and studying Kissinger has been so important to my life because it made me understand a lot of how the world works today. In studying Kissinger, and there's a load of, I haven't written about Kissinger yet that I'm still in the process of writing about that is really important and really can make you understand our modern world because it is being corrupted by this one man, Heinz. Heinz Kissinger. For some reason, the American establishment loved him. They boosted him up. They did that with a lot of German thinkers after World War II. I think the Germans who fought alongside Americans got seen as perfect Germans and the others were dirty Germans. But in a sense, that's wrong because Klaus Schwab, who was eventually brought on as well, his father was Eugen Schwab, worked in a model Nazi company as a managing director. So he was a Nazi, 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 big Nazi. Klaus Schwab's dad, big Nazi. And of course, those are the type of people Kissinger went house to house searching for during the war. Remember, he was uh, military intelligence looking for the after when, when the war ended, he was going house to house with Fritz Kramer and others looking for Nazis who were in hiding. I mean, serious job of intelligence. So he went from intelligence in the war to looking to become intelligence with the FBI, to given intelligence even after he wasn't recruited by the FBI, to going on to be with CFR and all the other things. And he was intelligence, intelligence, intelligence. Re when he got into the White House, he restructured the way intelligence worked so he could be more in control of intelligence and he could detach it so he could control the what well, I think he could control the downfall of presidents. Because I think Nixon got partially felt because of things involved with Kissinger. Um, it ran its course. Personally, I think that Nixon was a tool for uh, Rockefellers to get Kissinger into office, and they had their CIA boy, Gerald Ford, lined up alongside Kissinger to eventually take its his place, and so they could stay in office. And Carter was a blip in between. And then afterwards, you October surprise sees Bush and Reagan get in. So obviously, Kissinger's uh, influence on the world has been massive. And today is a big day. Today is the day Kissinger has died. So today is Kissinger has died. And this history, this history is going to be easier to speak about now. It's going to be people and mainstream outlets who will suddenly say, oh, was Kissinger a good guy after all? Or well, maybe he wasn't. Because they're, they're more likely to say that now. Because he's dead. The king is dead. Who's the king now? Probably Musk. If you want someone who's linked up with the establishment, someone who's who's been seen as the next big thing, the, the person who's going to do this and do that and change the world, maybe. Maybe it's Musk. Maybe Maybe he's uh, an example, but I think you won't find someone quite like Henry Kissinger for a while. You won't find anybody. Well, you'll find his head in a jar, I'm sure. Find his head in a jar. But that is a bit of a look into the rise of Henry Kissinger up until uh, International Seminar in the late 60s. And it's worth understanding Kissinger's rise um, and the start of it. And that's through um, looking at that article um dr Klaus schwab or how the cfr taught me to stop worrying and love the bomb and we've looked through some of the source materials in this news hound and i'm really glad to have done one and i'm really glad it's a good day today good day i know i know gloating over a uh, hundred year old dying is is you know is weak but uh, we take what we get nowadays the world is hard see you later like, share, subscribe. Help me out if you can. I need it.
Ah, you can uh, you can become a supporter on Patreon and other things. And there is a documentary uh, called Searching for Stanley coming out in December. The first series comes out and it's going to be wicked. So watch out for that. Afterwards, I should be serializing the documentary about the Schwab stuff and the Kissinger stuff and all of this stuff. Um, that will be extremely uh, useful as well for the future. So enjoy the new world order without Henry Kissinger. Bye.